If you have a scripture text, I'll be speaking from John chapter 14, verse 1. I'll be traveling a little bit around, but it, we'll start there. This is a hard ser- sermon for me to prepare for a number of reasons, not the least of which of our great love for our dear brother Gabe and our sister Rebecca and their family. But thank you for those of you who prayed, Brother Jason, as we were done, he reached out to me and he could just tell (laughs) I need some prayer. And so he just put his hand on me and the Lord, I felt like he came. So thank you, brother. It's hard to believe this day has actually arrived, isn't it? This final day, the last Sunday of your public ministry at Redeemer Bible Church. I remember where Kathy, let's see, my wife, Kathy, where is she? She's okay. She's in the back. She is, um, I'm sorry, this is not in my text. (laughs) She's embarrassed. She has a terrible back problem right now. She can't even sit, uh, and so she's standing right now. But when Kathy and I met you both, it was the first day. It was a chilly November Sunday morning in 2012. You had only been here for a couple of months, and we were still meeting at the Minnetonka High School. And as David Ward led us in worship, I still remember as we sang, there were moments during the songs where some young guy in the school auditorium would punctuate the quiet, measured Minnesota congregational singing with a shout to the Lord and a yo! I can't even do it justice, can I? (laughs) Yeah, it was that who did that. That was good. All right, thank you, John. Who was that? I thought as I was listening. So before I ever met you, Brother Gabe, I heard your voice lifted high to the Lord. Peter and Sharon Hedstrom are dear friends introduced us after the service, but behind the New Jersey accent and the offer to connect with Kathy and me over coffee, I can, see, I can't do that right either. I could already feel the intensity of your love for Jesus. It was as if the Lord had fused our hearts together even at that moment during the first worship service and afterwards. Bob Glenn would remark that it was because we were both Hispanic that we had this connection. But we all know that our connection in the spirit is more heated than any mere Latino blood. (laughs) Subsequently, we met your parents, Rebecca, at a Bethlehem pastor's conference here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. You come from a, a profoundly deep spiritual lineage, and you know that. Oaks of Righteousness, your father and mother, Faithful ministers of the gospel, your father weathered and wise and deep in theology and passionate for missions. They have left their mark of faithfulness deeply on both of you and actually on me as well. And it was out of this massive, deep-rooted foundation in both of you, Gabe and Rebecca, that the Lord himself came down on all of us in power those days. It was the first summer youth retreat in the August of 2013, you remember it well. You led the kids in prayer and the ministry of the word and prolonged times of worship, and the Lord fell on our youth. Wow. With such unmistakable clarity that we knew it was him. I remember that Sunday night of testimonies when the kids returned from camp, powerful Young men and women brought to tears of repentance and not just sorrow, but joy for Jesus Christ. But it was not a flash in the pan, a momentary birth of youthful recklessness, nor a music-induced emotionalism. Instead, the Lord used you both to begin something unusually breathtaking. He created a community of new creations. We would laugh because in the room, where Redemption Youth met, that's down there, you go down the steps, and all the way to the back, there was like a little church of parents and volunteers and redeemed youth, a haven of rest during those years of our darkest nights. Year after year, through your teaching and counseling and late-night talks and off-hour text message pleas for help and prayer and for consolation and years after years of teaching and retreats and prayer. You not only led our young men and women to faith, but you grounded them in the solidity of the gospel. Many were born again of such a quality that could not be faked. Kathy and I 
tasted the authenticity of their faith at your final youth retreat this last August. Wow, God has left a deep memorial for your service here. The lives of these young adults are marked by love for one another and ultimately for Christ to this very day. Jonathan Edwards, in the aftermath of the 18th century Great Awakening, helped distinguish fake signs of the Holy Spirit because they can, be, they can happen, and true signs of a genuine work of God. He saw the awakening with his own eyes, that Great Awakening, and in his book, Religious Affections, Edwards argued that though Satan can duplicate miraculous signs and spiritual experiences, the devil cannot actually change someone's nature. It's against his nature to change their nature. And so Edwards writes, Scripture, and he means everywhere in the Bible, strongly imply and signify a change of nature, such as, quote, being born again, becoming new creatures, rising from the dead, being renewed in the spirit of the mind, dying to sin, living to righteousness, putting off the old man, putting on the new man, being grafted into a new stock, uh, having a divine seed implanted in the heart, uh, being made partakers of the divine nature. You see what Edwards is saying? This new, fundamentally transformed, resurrected nature is what we witnessed in our youth these last five years. That, that's what we saw. Thank you, therefore, Gabe and Rebecca, for your ministry to our family as well. Our dear Abe, who in no small way can trace his heavenly nature through your faithful shepherding care. He's not here today. He is actually leading worship at Bethlehem. Another influence, thank you. <laughs> it's so powerful. And yet we always understood there was more to your calling, wasn't there? That God had for you more than youth ministry. From your years of worship, leading in your home churches in Chicago and in New Jersey, to your songwriting and musical giftedness, to your ushering us into the presence of the Lord Sunday after Sunday. Do you know how he does this? The Lord, through Brother Gabe, he gives us a welcome in the gospel. He helps us see that we are embraced by the Father. He then takes us up into the pinnacle of worship. And then when we behold the glory of God, we are, we are trembling with who he is, and we are brought very low, and yet he takes us through it, this dark season, and then we see the cross, and we see that we are accepted in Christ, and then he brings us back into the glory of who we are in Christ, and he does that this rhythm almost every Sunday, and that's not in my notes, but I'm just so thankful for how God does that through you. But we can see that God has a calling on your lives. He set you apart for another work. And finally, when it was perhaps unclear whether you would ever attend, you entered Bethlehem College and Seminary, now in your second year of seminary training. Three weeks ago, I met with Chuck Stedham, who not only is the campus pastor at Bethlehem South Campus, but also serves as your mentor in the worship track at the seminary. We, we met together, we talked of you, Gabe, warmly, affectionately, about your coming labors starting on May 1st, and Chuck finally said, thank you for connecting me with Gabe, and he meant that for all of you. This connection is profound that we feel with them, and we feel like it's another part of our family, but it is hard. You are loved here very much, and you will be loved there. The main difficulty, however, for us is that you are leaving. Now, yeah, 25 minutes away. Let's see wherever that is. Just down the way, right? 494 and down south to 35W, but day in and day out, we will no longer see you to beloved servants in the gospel that you are, dear brother and sister, and we will miss you. And so my text this morning is from Jesus' final discourse with the apostles in John chapter 13, verses, uh, excuse me, 13 through 17, but we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 14. Quote, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What pervades most of these chapters is the devastating sorrow overwhelming the disciples when they realize Jesus is leaving them to be executed. So the command in verse 1 of chapter 14, let your hearts not be troubled, is both an acknowledgement of their broken heartedness, but also a command. They must gain mastery over their free-falling emotional 
devastation. And the antidote, of course, for their affliction is trust. Believe in God, believe also in me. Judas's belief did not last. Isn't that amazing? Doubting Thomas is teetering on the edge of unbelief forever. So brokenheartedness can lead to faithlessness even in disciples. In some ways, the Zepeda's departure feels more like a symbolic loss, doesn't it? That all the years of our sorrow since Bob Glenn's dismissal is perhaps still not over. Gabe represents the last vocational minister from that original staff, and now it seems like a final chapter is closing for us. Also for the Zepeda's, life will not be easy, but will be very challenging. More years of seminary education, three beloved little ones who have grown before our eyes, Their lives are starting fresh again. More instability, more hard work. Gabe will be picking up an additional job to supplement his internship stipend from Bethlehem. All of this uncertainty for the sake of the gospel. And Kathy and I know their hardships well, so we feel deeply for them. And though Gabe's departure is infinitely less painful than Jesus is leaving his disciples, the bond of love we feel for them is no less intense because it is born of the Spirit. Its nature is identical. And the antidote for the sickness of our hearts remains the same in Jesus' mind. Believe in God, believe also in me. So in the time I have left, I want to try to answer this one question. Here it is. Why should our hearts not be troubled? If trusting God and Jesus' faithfulness is the serum for the venom of our unbelief, what should we believe in to still our troubled hearts? I'll give a few reasons before our time comes to a close, and then we'll pray. Here's the first one. The first reason our hearts should not be troubled is that You are not unloved. You are not unloved. Of course, one of the ways Satan diminishes our peace and dismantles our stability is to put in our hearts the doubt that perhaps God does not truly love us after all. I was just impressed. I'm just going to pause again. I am always surprised how God weaves worship together with our the Word and with prayer. It's as if He's orchestrating, and I know He is by the Spirit. This. This, this choreography of how he wants to unfold things. And, and I just, m- there are touch points in this message that you, that you brought together in the, the, in the word and in the singing. But it is a problem. Satan makes us tremble because we don't know if we're really loved after all by God. And perhaps all these events, the Zepeda's departure, our last few years of hardship as a church, and Gabe and Rebecca, the difficult unplanned route you took to be all the way from where you came to Minneapolis and now over to Bethlehem with more hardships yet to follow, perhaps all these difficulties are evidences that God does not after all really love us. This is how the principalities and powers, the demonic enemies of our souls. This is how they wage war mercilessly against us. And so we must fight. That's why there's fighter verses, aren't there? Let's go back to verse 1, excuse me, verse 21 of chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be skipping around a little bit in this area. Chapter 13, verse 21 reads, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then, after Jesus reveals the identity of his betrayer with a dipped morsel of bread, Judas leaves. And then in verse 31, an, a very profound statement. When he had gone out, so that moment he leaves, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So two glorifications simultaneously at that moment when Judas gets up and walks out. Right then, Jesus says, how is that possible? How is it that such betrayal actually glorifies the Son? What is happening that it serves as a means to honor the Son of Man? It is to demonstrate, of course, 
the love, the profound love that he has for us. Skip back to verse 1. John makes a commentary about what's about to happen in verse 1, the Apostle John. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, what does he have to say? That second point. He already said that he loved them who were in the world. Why does he have to say he loved them to the end? During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. So look at the verse again. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Telos in Greek. To the end, we translate it. But it doesn't just necessarily mean loved them to the end of his life, but it can also mean he loved them to completion. He loved them to the bitter end. He loved them to the ultimate, which means there was nothing left lacking in Jesus' love. In fact, we could interpret this sentence this way. Since Jesus loved his own who were in the world and since he loved them to the utter fullness, he demonstrates the completeness of his love by rising up from the table, and what's he about to do? Wash their feet. So the point that is that the farther the sun stoops, the lower he goes, the more he condescends and takes the lowest place, the more lowly he acts before his disciples, the very ones he loves, the more he is glorifying the Father in this. This is what's so surprising about this Darkness and sin and sorrow and despair seem to serve as the best canvas on which the sacrificial love of the Father and the Son are, is painted. It's most striking. It's most, most breathtaking when we behold it against the horror of betrayal and sin, like a gamma ray filled brilliant supernova in the great expanses of darkness in intergalactic nothingness pure darkness, no light, and suddenly, supernova. See how the brilliance of the supernova is shown even brighter because of the darkness. Or if you're a Minnesota boundaries water, and I saw Joe Hedstrom somewhere. We took a trip together. The guys, the Hedstroms and I and our guys, we went up there. Such a beautiful place. There were nights where you just, your jaw just drops. The loons are in the background. This is kind of in my notes, but I'm going a little farther. But you see that this, this darkness falls over and then the, the Milky Way and the stars, and then all of a sudden you just see these, these glimmers of magenta and violet and these hues of glory before you, and not a whisper. We see beauty in all of its glory against the backdrop of darkness. This is how God paints Jesus' love. Judas betrays, but suddenly selling out Jesus serves as the darkest possible backdrop on which the Father paints the brilliance of his love. And in the same way, Gabe and Rebecca, your decision to come to Minnesota, your sacrificial lives invested in the saints here at Redeemer, just, just echoing again what Brother Jason prayed, your future investment in seminary to learn the Word of God, all of these hardships and acts of love should make you not doubt God's love. Instead, you're serving to display it. See this? You don't get to be the beneficiaries, but we do, which is hard, of course. Your suffering helps us see the love of God in Jesus still clearer that he cares about us this much to send vocational ministers that give everything for us. So we thank God for you, Gabe and Rebecca, and for all the ministers of the gospel among us who love us tenderly. I could point you out if I could find all of you, but you're among us. They give their lives constantly, and so we should thank God. The question we're trying to answer is why should our hearts not be troubled? It's because this first reason I gave that we are not unloved. In fact, the Son of Almighty God stoops to the earth to love to the uttermost and he calls out servants like Gabe and Rebecca 
to incarnate that love to shine it still greater so that we can see brightly in their suffering how much God loves us. But you may still object. <laughs> you may say, well, my heart is still troubled. I, that's not going to help. That's not enough. Yes, God loves his people, often through the sacrifice of others. And yes, I agree. But verse 1 of chapter 13 says, having loved his own who were in the world. Maybe I'm not his own. Maybe my sin is so great, so heinous, so imperfect. Maybe like Judas, though I thought I was a disciple, perhaps in the end I'm nothing more than the betrayer of the Son of God. Those doubts enter in, don't they, at times? Satan is crafty. And so here's the second reason our hearts should not be troubled. It's because you are not unclean. You are not unclean. I've been listening to the Canadian clinical psychologist and professor. His name is Jordan Peterson. He has written a book called 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote for Chaos, or to Chaos. The popularity of his YouTube videos and his elevated prominence with topics like the dominance hierarchy of lobsters, if you've ever heard anything like that, or the empirical evidence for biological gender differentiation, Seems kind of boring, but it's extremely, extremely intensely provocative right now. In Rule 12, on petting cats, if you find them, he describes the existential crisis he endured watching his daughter year after year through her childhood endure excruciating suffering because of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. How can a God permit such agony? Peterson is riveting at times. And he even, as he reads his own book, he starts to choke up, which is surprising. They don't edit that out. Though he's probably not a Christian, he speaks a lot about the Bible and about Christ. And listen to him from Rule 7. Quote, Christ offers himself to God and the world to betrayal, torture, and death to the point of despair on the cross, where he cries out those terrible words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his Father, is simultaneously sacrificing his Son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of Son and Self is archetypal. It's a story at the limit where nothing more extreme, nothing greater can be imagined. He sees what, what he's saying about Jesus' death is that Jesus both offers the in the infinitely ultimate sacrifice himself, and the Father also offers the infinitely limitless sacrifice of his Son at the same time. That is sacrifice. He is struck by that. But what Peter misses is the purpose of Christ's sacrifice. It's not just a model for the honorable man, like something we should ascribe to if we're really manly men, but it is a payment, a ransom. In this story at the Last Supper, notice there is no Passover lamb. Did it ever strike you? Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No other substitute lamb will do. Listen to the dialogue with Simon Peter as Jesus washes his feet. Verse 6 of chapter 13. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my... Not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and what that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. What is striking about Simon Peter's cleanliness is that a little later, if you go to verse 36, we learn that he's about to deny Christ three times. Isn't that striking? He's clean, but he's also denying Jesus momentarily. 
Peter un- is clean, but Judas is unclean. Isn't that surprising? Why? It's because Peter's nature is clean in its essence. Again, Edwards is so helpful here when he talks about the fundamental nature change of all Christians, what we undergo, and this is again from Religious Affections, Jonathan Edwards, quote, nature is an abiding thing. So it it lives, it persists, it endures. That's because it's part of our nature. A swine that is is of a filthy nature may be washed, but the swinish nature remains, abides, it lasts. You can't wash it away. And a dove that is of a cleanly nature may be defiled, It might get dirty, really terribly dirty, but its cleanly nature remains. See the difference? Nature is the difference between a swine and a dove. And Peter proved at his core, his nature was not an unclean pig who took a bath, but a clean dove who was briefly defiled when he sinned so grievously because Jesus is saying that Peter's new nature was abiding, lasting. He did not give up. He did not kill himself like Judas. He continued to believe after his dark denials. Three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Finally, verse 17, Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. We are not cleansed by feeding Jesus' sheep, but our continued perseverance through suffering in caring for Jesus' flock demonstrates our nature is ultimately clean. We are new creatures. Our essence has been changed. We are not fleshly anymore, but we are spirit, even if we sin. Gabe and Rebecca, when Satan attacks you in your ministry and declares to you that you are an unclean Judas, just a swine who can never take enough baths. Tell Satan, be gone, Satan. I am not unclean. Jesus made me clean. I am a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. You can speak to him that way in Jesus' name. You can speak scripture when he lies to you. You are clean. We've looked at two reasons why the heart can be troubled, but reasons why we should not let it. First, we know that we are not unloved. Jesus does not hold back, but loves us to the uttermost. Second, your heart should not be troubled because you are not unclean. Your abiding service in Jesus proves that you are new creatures. You love like Jesus loves. You die for Jesus' sheep like Jesus dies. Your nature is categorically new, resurrected, clean, justified, ultimately glorified. It's already a done deal. There's no way to change who you are in Christ. That's what you are, not unclean. But you may have one final objection, and it happens to all of us. In our darkest moments, you may be tempted to ask hard things of God, You may say, yes, it is good, Lord, that I am not unloved and that I am not unclean. But what is the point of all this suffering for your flock? Vocational ministry is so difficult. Few people understand the depths of our pain. So much earthly loss. No home, no financial certainty, no parents or family nearby. Why shouldn't our hearts be troubled often? It's because of this last reason, which is certainly the best of all. Here it is. The reason why your heart should not be troubled is because you are not alone. One of the biggest difficulties of suffering, especially in ministry, is the sense that you are abandoned by the very Lord you are serving. He is quiet. He is silent. He doesn't seem to hear your cries to him. But Jesus understands our frailties. And in fact, he promises the exact opposite. We are not alone at all. Verse 16 of chapter 14, if you want to skip ahead. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Notice that. Another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the Lord cannot receive, excuse me, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. 
For, here's the reason why you know him and the world does not, because he dwells with you. That's the spirit we sang about. He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So if the spirit is another helper, a different helper than the one who currently is existing, then there must be a first helper, right? The word helper is difficult to translate, and I'm following Tim Keller here, but helper, parakletos, is actually a legal term. Someone who goes to advocate for you in the court of law to exonerate you of guilt. We see the same technical word in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a parakletos, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So in his heavenly court, the Father has so constructed it that if there are those who are guilty, right now, Jesus, the righteous one, serves as our advocate with the Father constantly. As it were, Jesus' pierced side and his hands and his propitiating, anger-averting blood is before the Father constantly at his judicial bench. And of course, how could the judge then not forgive his The offering is right before him, advocating for you at that very bench. But why do we need another parakletos if we have first? Isn't that interesting? The reason we need another advocate, another spirit, is because the Father does not condemn us. How could he? The Son standing right in front of him. The Son does not condemn us. He's the one who loves you so much that he gave his own life. The Spirit does not condemn us. We condemn ourselves, don't we? We need Jesus, the Father, by the Spirit, living in us to tell us, you are not guilty. You are my son. Cry now, Abba, Father. Recognize who you are, your identity, your new nature. You are not guilty. He needs to tell us that constantly because we forget The Spirit of Jesus is given to dwell with you forever. In verse 6, you are not orphans, dear Gabe and Rebecca. He will never leave you or forsake you. But there's more. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And this is an amazing promise, still greater. And my Father will love me and we will come to him and make our home with him. We know in Jesus' mind that love does not mean keeping his word perfectly, right? Right? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. It does not mean perfectly because Peter denied Christ three times and yet he loves Christ. So how could he love Jesus and deny him? Because love does not mean perfection. It means persevering in belief and keeping Christ's word and in Peter's case, to feed his flock, to tend his lambs. So our dear brother Gabe and our sister Rebecca, you meet the conditions of verse 23. You are loving him by keeping his word. And so there remains for you a great promise. You have given your lives for his little ones, his flock, his lambs. And so the promise for you is staggering. Verse 23, Jesus promises the Father will love you and the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the entire Trinity will not just come to you, but they will make their home with you. You have a forever Father who does not just come and make a brief visit and say, hey, great to see you. I hope you're doing well. Hey, I'm really busy. I hope things go well for you, but I've got to go. I've got some other things I've got to take care of. You have a Father who wants to be with you forever. He wants to live with you. He wants to dwell with you. And the whole Trinity, the whole community of the Godhead wants to live in you. And he communicates that by his spirit. Do not let your hearts be troubled, dear brother and sister. You have chosen the good part. You have no permanent place to rest your head, no home, no earthly security. You are wanderers on the planet for the sake of the gospel. But you are not unloved. You are not unclean, and you are not alone. You have the entire Godhead with you. Your heavenly Father and the eternal Son of God and the advocating Spirit is preparing a place for you. Let not your hearts be troubled. 
believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go, I prepare a place for you, and I will come again, and I will take you to myself. Why? That where I am, you may be also. He wants to live forever with you. That's why he's gone, to prepare a place for you forever. You have not left anything behind that won't be replaced a billion, million times more, infinitely more in heaven where you have an eternal dwelling with the Father and the Son and the Spirit forevermore. Let's pray.